Did you ever take a bite of food and immediately transport backwards in time? Mm. It just happened to me right now when I took a bite of this Gros Michel banana. The Gros Michel banana is what bananas used to taste like before bananas lost their flavor. This is a bunch of Gros Michel bananas I grew here on my farm. In fact, I grew them right over there. This is a bunch of store-bought bananas. This variety is called the Cavendish. If you had access to a source of Gros Michel bananas, you would never eat another Cavendish again. Unfortunately, you can't get these Gros Michels. The only way to get them is to grow them yourself. You see, the Gros Michel can no longer be grown commercially. In the 1950s, banana plantations all around Central America were almost wiped out from Panama disease. They had to scramble. They had to find a different variety to grow. And they found that the Cavendish banana was resistant to Panama disease. So they stopped planting the Gros Michel and replaced it with the now ubiquitous Cavendish banana. As a commercial product, the Cavendish has a lot of advantages. It's got a thick skin and it can take abuse. You can pick it green and ship it so that it ripens on the way to the market. The trees produce very well. But when it comes to flavor, one of these cannot even touch a bite from a Gros Michel. I actually, I actually feel like I'm eating candy right now. And there's a very good reason for that. Any type of banana flavoring that you eat, banana candy, banana shakes, banana taffy, is based on the flavor of the Gros Michel. You can Google it to get the name, but whatever the little chemical is that gives bananas their banana flavor, there's a lot more of it in a Gros Michel than there is in a Cavendish. And the reason I said I was transported back in time earlier is because when I take a bite of a Gros Michel, it reminds me of sitting in my grandmother's kitchen in the 1970s. Now, I don't know if the bananas my grandmother was buying at the grocery store four decades ago were in fact Gros Michel, but they weren't Cavendish. They were much more banana flavored. The same thing happens to me when I bite into a homegrown tomato or an heirloom tomato or a homegrown strawberry. It reminds me of sitting at my grandmother's kitchen table in the 70s and early 80s. It's because the food had flavor back then. It was actually selected for its flavor. And it's because our logistics system was different four decades ago. We had to source our food more locally. Food was seasonal. We couldn't get everything all year round. We couldn't get corn until August and September. We couldn't get apples until the fall. And frankly, in the neighborhood I grew up in, just about everyone grew their own garden anyhow. They didn't buy their produce at grocery stores. But as our economy evolved, and as logistics systems became more sophisticated and more reliable, it became possible to grow things in one place on the planet and ship them to another in only a matter of days. But that came with a cost. We traded freshness, quality, and flavor for 365 day availability. You see, in order to get these bananas from, I'm gonna guess Honduras, Ecuador. In order to get these bananas from Ecuador to Scranton, Pennsylvania, or Flint, Michigan, or Sacramento, California, they have to be harvested when they're green. Same goes for tomatoes, same goes for a lot of other crops. And then the fruits and vegetables are often chilled and hit with gases to slow the ripening process so that they arrive at your local supermarket prior to ripening. Well, that messes with the flavor. That messes with the freshness. That's why your homegrown tomatoes and your homegrown peppers and your homegrown cantaloupe and corn taste so much better. What people cultivate in the large scale farming operations is more a matter of what they can get to market than the actual quality of the product they produce. Let me give you an example. This is a, this is a star fruit tree behind me, also known as carambola. These things are delicious, but they don't travel well. Now you may have seen star fruit, you may have even tasted it, but I doubt it's one of your favorite fruits. And it's because you haven't had it fresh. You haven't had it ripe. A properly ripened star fruit has this very deep orange color to it. Now go to your local supermarket You'll see a box of nasty star fruit. They'll be yellow like this. And it's because in order to pack them, put them on a truck and get them to wherever you are, they had to be picked off the tree 
prematurely, but they will not ripen properly that way. Similarly, I have this tree right here, this lone guy right there. That's called a jabata caba, and that is a Brazilian tree. It's almost like a cherry. Uh, it grows right off the trunk, right off the bark of the tree. Look it up, Google it, jobata caba. It's like J-O-B-A-T-I. Then Google will fill in the rest for you, you know? But it, it has such a unique flavor, I can't compare it to anything. Like I just compared the carambola to an apple. I can't even compare jabata caba. But similarly, I can't go harvest a bunch of these, box them up and send them somewhere and sell them because they will go bad before someone has a chance to eat them. Another one of my favorite fruits that also happens to be extremely delicate is right here behind me. This is called loquat. And this tree is just starting to flower. It's November, it's right around Thanksgiving time right now. This gives me fruit in February. It is some of the most delicious fruit I have ever eaten. It is also the most delicate fruit I've ever grown. They taste so good. They would be such a popular fruit in the supermarket, but we, we can't get them there. This is the reason why a lot of the stuff you get at a local farmer's market tastes a lot better than what you get in the supermarket. Let's take tomatoes as an example. If the farmer wants to pick his tomatoes and send them off to market, he's got to pick them when they're still green, right? They get gassed, they get chilled. People are messing with the ripening process of the tomato. But at a farmer's market, he's just picking what's left out in the field and going right to market with it. It's not gassed, it's not chilled, it's picked at the appropriate time, right? Now I grow my own bananas and I have the luxury of leaving them on the trees back there until they're ready to eat. I don't even take a bunch off the tree until the first few turn yellow, which is what I did with this bunch of gross Michelle. Behind me here is another cluster or clump of bananas. These are called Brazilian pygmies and they only grow to about six feet tall and they give the most delicious fruity flavored tiny little bananas. I love them. And elsewhere on my property, I have other varieties of banana. We grow one variety called Manzano, which tastes like an apple. Some of them only produce a little bit. Some of them give me a bunch so big my son can't even lift it. We can't even eat them all. So if there's so many varieties of bananas and the quality is so much better than the Cavendish, why don't you see them at your supermarket? Well, I already told you the reason you don't see the Gros Michel, which is the classic banana flavored banana. And just to remind you, it's because of Panama disease. These cannot be grown commercially any longer. If you try to do a plantation of these bananas, they're just gonna all die on you. But these Namwas grow just fine. The blue Javas here, I'll show you that picture of my son with that bunch of blue Javas again. The blue Javas grow just fine. These Brazilian pygmies behind me, my plantains, my manzanos, why don't we see those in the supermarket? The answer is logistics. The Cavendish is a workhorse. It's disease resistant, it travels well, it has a good shelf life, it's resilient and resistant to bruising. And the consumer is not really aware of the other options that are out there. So from a business perspective, it makes good economic sense to grow and sell the Cavendish. If you think about it, aside from apples, you really don't get much variety within types of fruit at the supermarket. Yeah, there's gonna be a handful of types of oranges, a handful, of, you might have like cherry tomatoes and beefsteak tomatoes and that sort of thing. But the supermarket offers nowhere near the variety that mother nature gives us. You see, first of all, the food has to be edible. It can't kill us. It can't make us sick. It has to be appealing to the human palate, right? It's got to taste at least decent. But most of the food we eat started out wild, like this wild avocado I'm holding. Now, this is a, a cultivated avocado. This is a cultivar called Hall. This is a wild avocado that just grew from seed. You would not want to eat this. You would not want to feed this to your dog. Okay, so we say to ourselves, this thing's disgusting. We're not gonna eat these anymore because I was out walking around the forest and I found this one. First of all, it's a lot bigger. It's got a lot more flesh inside it compared to the pit that's inside. And it happens to taste delicious. So we're gonna grow more of these. We're gonna domesticate these. And little by little, people learn more about agriculture was able to domesticate and cultivate the different fruits and vegetables that they needed. Populations were able to grow. And eventually we get to now, right? November, 2022. And we've got such an intricate and well-tuned logistics system that as of this month, November, 2022, 
The Earth's population just crested the 8 billion mark. There are 8 billion hungry mouths to feed every day on planet Earth. In order to feed 8 billion hungry mouths, we not only need a lot of food, we not only need our avocado trees to give us tons and tons of fruit, but we need a way to get that fruit to market so that it is still edible. Let me pick this Monroe avocado. Mon Monroe is a variety we grow here at Sleepy Lizard Avocado Farm and the trees are prolific. I mean, they produce, you could see just hundreds of avocados on, on the one or two trees here behind me. And they're this nice egg shape. And from the minute I pick this, this has seven to 10 days to get to market without chilling and without gassing. It's also hard as rock when they're first picked. These things are tough. They don't bruise. You can stack boxes on top of each other. Now this one here has been off the tree about a week. It's already starting to soften. But these things have enough time to get to the market, to get to the shelves, and to get home to your kitchen counter before they spoil. But I want you to take note of something here. Look at the, the difference in the shape between these and these. And this haul is delicious. If you let this thing ripen properly, it will blow your mind. And the Russell is also delicious. But if you go to a market that carries Florida variety avocados, you're going to see more of these shiny egg-shaped ones. Why? Because these are easier to transport. We could fit more of these in a box. Now, luckily, the quality of the Monroe is on par with the Hall and Russell. But even if it wasn't, even if these things didn't taste as good, we'd be sending more of these to market than we do these simply because of logistics. It is not easy to get food out to 8 billion people all over the earth every single day so that it doesn't spoil. Which brings us back to the rather bland Cavendish banana. We can grow these and ship them around the world all year long, providing the biomass that the 8 billion people on this planet need to survive and thrive. Do these taste better? Yes, way better. Can we maybe try really, really hard to do something for the gross Michelle to make it resistant to Panama disease? Maybe, but it would drive the price per unit so high it would not be efficient. Can we leave our tomatoes and melons and peppers on the vine until they're almost ripe? Yeah, but then you'd have to overnight everything and eat it the next day or the day after. It is not practical and certainly not cost effective. I know all of you are very, very passionate about your fruit. And if you got a chance to taste some namwas, you'd want more. If you got a chance to taste the Gros Michel, you'd probably never eat a different banana as long as you had a supply of these. Now, I don't grow enough of these to sell, but I suggest you go on Google and look for places that will so you could try some different banana varieties. But I do sell avocados. And if the crows will give me a moment's peace, I will tell you to go to guacfarm.com. G-U-A-C-F-A-R-M.com. We sell eight pound boxes of these delicious avocados at guacfarm.com. We have a few styles of t-shirt. And depending on the time of year, I have other types of tropical fruit. The type of tropical fruit that travels well. I can't sell my star fruit. I can't sell my jabata kaba. I can't sell my loquats because they just won't make it to you before they go bad. Now it's just about dinner time and I'm holding a ripe Hall avocado in my hands. I'm gonna go in the house and chop this up, put it with some white rice, and salt and pepper, and have some dinner. While I do that, you go to guacfarm.com and I will see you on the next video.